Good evening, everyone, and welcome. This is the CNC3 7 p.m. News. I'm Kamal Georges. And I'm Ria Rambali. In our headlines tonight, more police hotlines being established as victims of abuse come forward with critical information against perpetrators. As unions gear up to march this Friday, the Labour Minister calls on leaders to return to the negotiating table. And I'm Jasmine Rook with Sport. Here's a look at what's coming up. International friendlies are on the horizon for Angus Eve's national under-20 team. He's ready to increase squad competitiveness as the CONCACAF Championship nears. It was a wet start today, but what weather conditions can we expect this week? Join me, Clay Hussein, for the details in tonight's forecast. Another hotline will be established for victims of abuse at children's homes. The move follows troubling findings contained in the 1997 Robert Sabga report and the recent Judith Jones report into children's homes. TTPS Public Information Officer ASP Sheridan Hill tells CNC3 News the criminal division will announce a cell phone number soon. The announcement comes two days after the TTPS launched a hotline for anyone with information about the cases of abuse in the Sabga report. Hill could not say how many calls the hotline received up to yesterday. However, he said an investigation has been launched into allegations contained in the report. A team has been appointed by the Commissioner of Police, headed by... Acting Superintendent Claire Guy Allen, head of the Special Victims Department. A hotline has been established. We're going to put out a cell phone number in addition to the hotline number, and persons are coming forward and making reports. We also have a copy of the report in our possession. A senior police officer tells CNC3 News once a report is compiled by the division, it will be submitted to the Special Victims Department. Investigators there will begin making contact with the callers. The TTPS again urged victims and anyone with information to contact the hotline. There is no cover-up of the Judith Jones report into abuse at children's homes. This is from Gender and Child Affairs Minister Dr. Ayanna Webster-Roy. She was responding to claims by opposition Senator David Nakid, who said on Sunday the government was focusing on the 1997 Sabga report to divert attention from the recent findings of the Jones report. In a release this evening, she says there is no such motive as the government commissioned the Jones report. She says all reports of child abuse are forwarded to the Children's Authority and the police for investigation. She also denies that $136 million was allocated to the task force set up to implement the report's recommendations. In fact, she says several agencies were allocated $126 million to implement the recommendations to safeguard the nation's children. The Public Services Association is tonight demanding a 25% increase in salaries for its members. But in light of a 2% offer on the table for all public sector workers, several union bodies plan to stage a protest on Friday. However, the Labour Minister is urging them to go back to the negotiating table. Chester Sambrano has this story, as well as what two economists have to say about the offer from the Chief Personal Officer. A 2% obviously can in no way compensate over the last eight years for that loss in purchasing power, so it is really too low. Dr. Valmiki Arjun agrees. The proposed 2% increase in salary is, in my view, it's unfounded. It is very minuscule when we look at the extent to which prices have increased over the last eight years, and quite frankly, it's very unfair. It is with this in mind, the Public Services Association is asking for a 25% increase. But as its president explains, this figure is only meant to play catch up with workers' purchasing power. It's not an increase as the Prime Minister is purported. You want the person just to be able to get the same basket as this. And hence a proposal is made that you attempt to negate the impact of inflation on the person's income. Batiste tells the CNC3 News Basic things like food, clothes, and shelter have increased significantly over the bargaining period. He is also of the view that the government can afford to pay workers more by reprioritizing its expenditure. They want to put a burden on the backs of workers that they are willing to carry themselves. If the country is so badly off, why you not give up all those perks of your office? I will lead by example. 
And while Batiste says the PSA will take what action it deems necessary to respond to the CPO, other unions are gearing up for a march on Friday. You see the 2% has raised the sleeping giant in workers. Workers are upset. Before hitting the streets, however, the unions are being urged by the Labour Minister to stay at the negotiating table. But running off at this point in time um, really serves no purpose but to do the negotiation in the public space. Meanwhile, Finance Minister Colm Embert in a Twitter post says a 2% wage increase for the entire state sector will cost taxpayers $600 million more annually. He says a 5% would run into the billions as part of government's recurrent expenditure. Dr. Sajiwan says government has itself to blame for not being able to adequately increase worker salaries. This, as she says, government has failed to grow the economy and create additional revenue streams. She has this message for public sector workers. I understand your, your demands, but it, it is a burden that as an economy, unfortunately, we simply can't afford. Chester Sambrano, CNC3 News. Well, Finance Minister Com Imbert is rubbishing claims that government altered the collective bargaining period without consultation with trade unions. Imbert's latest denial comes amid upset over a proposed 2% wage increase to public servants for an eight-year period. Union leaders have called the offer insulting. Just yesterday, Prime Minister Dr. Case Raleigh defended the Chief Personal Officer's submission and called on public servants not to shut down the country. Addressing concerns raised in Parliament, Minister Imbert said government did not act unlawfully. The Industrial Relations Act, Chapter 8801, sec Section 411, indicates that a collective agreement shall be for a minimum period of three years and can be for a maximum period of five years. So therefore, there is no unilateral change to anything. This is entirely within the law. Meanwhile, the finance minister accused the opposition UNC of peddling misinformation about the current wage negotiation climate. He also refuted claims that government was not legally required to meet with union leaders about the matter. Welcome back, everyone. Government is exploring vaccination options for monkeypox amid global, growing global concerns over infections. Responding to questions in the Parliament today, Health Minister Terence Dial Singh said meetings have been convened to discuss the disease. According to him, they have placed Port Health on high alert for screening and alerted RHA physicians to diagnose and treat with monkeypox. He added that further strategies were also being considered. We are proactively reaching out to all our local and international partners to acquire the vaccination J-Y-N-N-E-O-S. The vaccination strategy at this point in time, if we get the vaccines, is not a national vaccination drive like COVID. The World Health Organization has said that the spread of monkeypox to non-endemic countries was a highly unusual event and warned that infections are likely to spread. TNT has received the first pediatric COVID-19 vaccines in the region. The 43,000 doses donated by Spain arrived just before 7 a.m. today. A release from the Foreign Affairs Ministry expressed appreciation for the donation. It says it is the result of two months of diplomatic and tactical engagement between both countries. Now that it's here, the Pediatric Society President, Virendra Singh, encourages people to get their children vaccinated. They have seen a lot of severe spectrum pediatric disease from COVID-19 and the option to protect the child given to families now to me is something that I mean I wish it were here before. Dr. Singh says the receipt of these doses is a privilege that people should not let go to waste. This is an opportunity that other countries who are less fortunate than we have been. We've begged for vaccines, we've been granted vaccines that other countries still either couldn't afford or couldn't access in front of us, I guess. 
The health ministry confirmed a short while ago that these doses will be administered from Wednesday. Cases have plateaued among the school population in Tobago, according to island officials. But while it's good news, parents are still being urged to keep their children home once they display flu-like symptoms. This means even if they believe their children have sinus problems, Rashad Khan has more. There have been at least 82 COVID-19 cases at schools in Tobago since physical classes resumed a month ago. That's according to the island's education division's education officer, Dr. Dane Joseph, on Monday. The majority of these cases came from the Central Division. However, according to Dr. Joseph, the outlook is improving. In the early years, the case number per week were, were relatively high at a number of 17. However, this has gradually reduced and now we are seeing actually a plateau of cases being around 10 to 12 cases per week amongst our schools. These cases represent around 8% of the 950 cases in schools across both islands to date. The officials call on parents to keep their children at home once they display flu-like symptoms, get them tested and report it to the teacher. This means even if they believe the child is suffering from allergies brought on by the Sahara dust. But you cannot know that it's not COVID-19 without getting tested because these symptoms are exactly the same. The Health Division Secretary, Dr. Faith B. Israel, urged parents to also get their children vaccinated now that the pediatric doses for those between the ages of 5 to 11 arrived on Monday. She says there are two recent cases of Miss C on the island, which vaccines could help prevent from happening ever again. Rashad Khan, CNC3 News. To some other news now, nearly 200 people have been detained in connection with a theft and vandalism of TSCT cables across the country for the year so far. The revelation was made by Public Utilities Minister Marvin Gonzalez, who was responding to questions about what was being done to address the issue. Gonzalez said as TSCT moves customers away from its copper network to the advanced fiber network, it has commenced the removal of the copper plant. He also maintained that the company will expedite the process to remove overhanging cables following recent attacks. 184 persons have been apprehended and taken before the courts for such offenses. And I am advised by TSTT that given the speed and the increased vandalism that has been taking place over the last couple months, that it intends to complete this process within the next three to four months. Gonzalez also warned that efforts have been ramped up to guard against the burglary of copper lines until they are officially removed by TSTT. TSTT has advised that it has, in, I, it has identified the main target areas for these copper thefts and has increased its security patrols in these areas and has intensified its collaboration with the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. Earlier this month, the Scrap Iron Dealers Association called on government to amend the existing scrap iron policy to halt the trade of stolen copper wire. After an absence of 24 years, cruise liner Royal Caribbean International will be playing an instrumental role in developing this country's tourism sector. This initiative will create thousands of jobs for citizens. Gisha Kaulasa Alonso gives us the details in tonight's Business Watch. The signing of a memorandum of understanding between the Ministry of Tourism and Royal Caribbean International will launch a major recruitment exercise for T and T nationals. At the signing held earlier today at the Hilton Hotel and Conference Center, Tourism Minister Randall Mitchell shared some details. Through the career portal that you must apply, you will find everything from the marine category, deck officers, electrical and engine room type positions, to casino operations, culinary management, food and beverage operations, and guest services, to information technology, entertainment, and housekeeping. According to the minister, citizens will not only earn US dollars, but will also be part of 77 ports of call. So how can one apply? There is no requirement for CXE passes for most of the positions in hospitality, except those more technical positions available such as those in the marine department that an applicant would be a, would be required to demonstrate some competence applicants must also present a certificate of character 
and there's no application fee. Wendy MacDonald of the Royal Caribbean Group, who also shared some details, says most of the company's ships are now sailing. She adds that Royal Caribbean's International Southern Caribbean 2023 itinerary will feature this country as a destination. We believe that for a business to thrive, it needs to be a part of the community. We don't just visit destinations, we work to be active community partners. In June, the ministry will host three recruitment initiatives, one in San Fernando, one in Port of Spain, and the other in Tobago. Geisha Kaulis Alonso, CNC3, Business Watch. From today, the consular section of the U.S. Embassy is introducing a new system to process mail-in visa renewal applications. The embassy says this is aimed at reducing the amount of time the consular section keeps applicants' passports. In a media release today, it says applicants who qualify to have interviews waived for their visa renewal applications will be placed in a virtual queue which will allow them to keep their passports and required documents until notified for further processing. It notes that applicants must provide accurate and up-to-date contact information at the time of applying. Those who qualify for interview waivers for their visa renewals will be notified via email with instructions on how to submit their passport and documents. People who submitted an application prior to today will not be placed in that virtual queue. Welcome back. Parts of central and southwest Trinidad will be without water tomorrow. Wasa says this is due to an emergency shutdown of the Point Lisa's desalination plant. The desalination company has indicated that operations at the plant will be stopped for a maximum period of eight hours in order to conduct emergency repairs to the communication control system at that facility. Wasa says there will be a disruption to their pipeborne water supply from 9.30 a.m. On the screen is a listing of the affected areas. WASA is asking customers to manage their water use efficiently. It may take up to 48 hours for the supply to normalize to some affected areas after the plant returns to full operation. The authority apologizes for the inconvenience caused as a result of the shutdown at the desalination plant. Political scientist Dr. Shane Mohammed says anyone seeking to dethrone political leader Kamala Prasad Bisesa must beat her at her own game. On Saturday, Prasad Bisesa announced that June 26 will be the UNC's internal elections. Her position as political, political leader is up for grabs. Speaking on CNC3's The Morning Brew today, Dr. Mohammed said there has been no free and fair internal elections in the UNC for the last decade. I make no apologies for saying this, um, and I am speaking from a, from a position of experience that the UNC internal elections under Kamala Prasad Bisesa has never been fair, free and fair from interference. Mohammed now questions whether she has the ability to carry on. Mrs. Prasad Bisesa in the last couple of years have not shown the capacity the resilience, the viability, um, the confidence to carry on as a strong opposition leader and a strong political leader. Uh, just on Monday, when Mr. Spasabi Sessa was making a speech at the Monday Night Forum, there were there are certain words that Mrs. Spasabi Sessa cannot pronounce. Prasad Bisasa became the UNC leader after defeating party founder Bastio Pandey in 2010. Mohammed believes former Minister of Health Dr. Fuad Khan and political, as political leader and former National Security Minister Jack Warner as chairman could help the UNC rebuild itself. A non-profit company representing Liberia residents affected by a 2013 oil spill has lost its bid to pursue a multi-million dollar lawsuit against Petrotrin. The judgment was delivered this morning by five law lords of the Privy Council. The company called Liberia Environs Protectors was formed by over 100 residents affected by that 2013 oil spill. The Privy Council ruled that while the residents could pursue a case, 
their company could not do it on their behalf. The decision in the appeal does not mean that the residents are without the possibility of redress as the company has a pending application to substitute several residents as claimants. <laughs> It was quite a dusty yeah. weekend, Kamal. Uh, with some rainfall today, we finally got a glimpse of our northern range. Let's go to Kaleen Hussein now for a look at our weather forecast. Ray and Kamal, you can see the mountains once again because that Saharan dust has finally moved away from Trinidad and Tobago just for a short period. And that's all due to the passage of a tropical wave that moved across the country on Sunday into Monday. A lot of the activity trailed the tropical wave and that's why we had a wet start to Monday. But we do expect to see some more unsettled weather over the next couple of hours. That's because we have a surface trough to east of Trinidad and Tobago, an area of lower than usual pressure that has some unsettled weather and that will be affecting us overnight tonight into to tomorrow morning but looking further we have some more saharan dust to our east not as significant concentrations as last week but still enough to reduce visibility and air quality from tuesday night into wednesday now we have another tropical wave that will be affecting us by the weekend now looking at the forecast for us overnight tonight you want to be pulling those covers because we do expect cooler temperatures as of minimum lows between 22 and 24 degrees and we are expecting some rainfall as well with heavier rainfall favoring tobago and eastern trinidad we could even see an isolated thunderstorm or two, but again, really favoring our offshore areas. And for tomorrow, variably cloudy skies throughout the day, but the sunshine should be peaking out by the late afternoon into the evening. Rainfall will really favor the first half of the day, and that's when we're watching out for localized areas of gusty winds or even street flooding in those heavier showers or thunderstorms. Maximum high temperature tomorrow getting up to around 30 degrees because of all that cloud cover. So plan ahead for the commute tomorrow, walk with the umbrellas, and if you're looking to head to the beach, it may not be the best day to go because of the weather. But for mariners, seas and open waters will be up to 1.5 meters. In sheltered areas, below 1 meter. And mariners need to exercise caution, especially on our northern and eastern coastlines because of those heavier showers or thunderstorms where seas can become locally choppy or even rough. Now looking at the weather forecast through the rest of the week, we have the unsettled weather wrapping up by Wednesday as that Saharan dust moves in. We'll be drying out, a high pressure system moves in, so we'll be seeing sunniest skies to end the week. Temperatures will be warming up to 32 degrees, so we'll be able to put away the umbrellas, bring out the water and sunscreen. But by the weekend, another tropical wave moves in, and we'll be seeing increased cloudiness then, maybe even some rainfall. More than a week after she was killed, the common-law husband of Marva Sutherland uh, was charged with her murder. Jerry Horn of Waterwheel Road in Dago Martin was charged with murder over the weekend. On May 11th, Sutherland was struck to her head with a rock. She was found dead by one of her daughters. The 57-year-old man was arrested one day after her killing. He appeared before a Port of Spain magistrate earlier today. A 34-year-old Lance Corporal attached to the Trinidad and Tobago Regiment charged with forging a CSEC certificate has been granted $60,000 bail. Sheldon Martin of Lionsgate Chaguanas was arrested for the offense last week. According to police, on April 26, a Lance Corporal presented the fake document during a pre-interview recruitment exercise at the TTR headquarters. Martin is expected to answer the charges at the Port of Spain Magistrates Court on June 29th. The Paria Commission of Inquiry into the deaths of four divers is currently in its investigative stage. The update was provided by Finance Minister Carl Mimbert, who was responding to questions on behalf of Energy Minister Stuart Young about the commencement of the inquiry. A month ago, Justice Dennis Morrison and subsea specialist Gregory Wilson received their instruments of appointment to probe the drowning of the divers back in February. According to Imbert, the current process was critical to the inquiry. During this stage, the relevant evidence is obtained and identified, and the relevant witness statements are prepared. This investigative stage of the inquiry is regarded as the lifeblood of the inquiry and prepares the way forward for the evidential stage of the inquiry in, at which witnesses would be called to give evidence. The procedural hearing of the Commission is proposed to be held in August of 2022. 
Minister Imbert said after the procedural hearings are concluded, an announcement will be made by the commissioner as to the evidential stage of the inquiry. Meanwhile, it was revealed that no action has been taken against Coast Guard officers present during the incident amid accusations that they failed to provide support. Paria Fuel Trading Company previously denied that officials blocked rescue efforts. The team of Coast Guard officers that was on duty during the tragic incident at Paria Fuel Trading Company's birth number six offshore platform was and remains a shore-based dive team and as such cannot by definition be relieved of seagoing duties. Yusuf Henry, Faisal Kurban, Kazim Ali Jr. and Rishi Nagisa drowned after they were sucked into a pipeline while doing works for Paria Trading Company Limited. Uh, uh, that should be for LMCS on behalf of Paria Fuel Trading Limited in February. Welcome back, everyone. Fishermen in Tobago are not pleased with the 12 cents gas rebate available to them from next Tuesday. Last Thursday, the Department of Marine Resources and Fisheries announced that the National Gas Rebate Incentive Program will be relaunched month end, but this will only be available to registered fishermen who operate registered vessels. Head of the All Tobago Fisher Folk Association, Curtis Douglas, says. 12 cents is barely enough to cover at least a fraction of their bills. You can't even buy a mint with 12 cents. You can't even buy a mint with 25 cents. So we are asking, we are asking, we didn't any, only come to make noise, you know, we come with a solution. We are asking the minister, the minister of finance, Mr. Imbert, to increase the gas, gas rebate, right, to 50 cents per liter. Douglas says the association is fed up of the neglect Tobago fishermen continue to receive. I don't know if the, the, the teacher or the fishers going to have it retroactive because we've been asking for this for years, so we don't know if they're going to pay us for all of those years that they hasn't paid us. Or if they're not, they need to fire someone. They need to get rid of someone because I cannot understand why it is Trinidad is getting gas rebate and Tobago is not getting. The group is calling on Chief Secretary Farley Augustine to intervene and raise their concerns to central government. <music> to some international news now, at least seven people have died after a high-speed Philippine ferry carrying 134 people caught fire. The blaze ripped through the ferry and forced passengers to jump overboard. 120 passengers were rescued, with 23 of them treated for injuries. Here's more in this report from Al Jazeera. The Philippine Coast Guard says it received a distressed call around 6 a.m. on Monday. A naval vessel called MV Murcraft 2, carrying more than 130 people, had caught fire near the waters of Rizal Quezon Province, north of the Philippines. And by midday, more than 100 people were rescued, including eight of the boat's crew members. Some of those injured were taken to hospital. The fire has been put out, but authorities are also checking for traces of oil spill. Initially, they said that um, the fire started at the engine room, but we'll try to get to the bottom of it. We have accounted all the passengers, including the crew. Uh, we have stopped already the search and rescue operations and we just uh, probably proceed to the investigation. This company has another incident in sometime in 2017. At least six other vessels helped the Coast Guard's search and rescue operations. Let's recap the day's main headlines as we leave you this evening. Another Victims of child abuse are coming forward with their horror stories. Police service confirms hotlines are being established to collect crucial information against perpetrators. As unions gear up to march this Friday, the Labour Minister calls on leaders to return to the negotiating table. That's all that we have time for this evening. Thank you so very much for joining us. I'm Kamal Georges. And I'm Maria Rambley. Have a good night.